tonight, the search for the Titanic submersible zeroes in on noises coming from deep in the Atlantic. The noises have been described as banging noises. With just hours now until it's feared oxygen will run out, those who know the people on board hold out hope. It's a terrible thought to know I have actual friends there, people I, I've met. One of Canada's biggest bread companies pleads guilty to a price-fixing scheme, making sure you paid more for your loaf. This is a significant fine, and now you really do have a conspiracy. And a monument for the missing and murdered, giving Indigenous families a new chance to honour and heal. It helps me know that I'm not the only one in this world that's facing the loss of grief. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Survival now may be a matter of hours for five people trapped inside a missing submersible deep in the North Atlantic. And the efforts to find them are only intensifying as time cruelly ticks by. Underwater sounds first detected by Canadian planes are now the focus of that search, but still no answers as to where they are. The ocean is not yet giving them up. Kayla Hounsell starts us off tonight from St. John's, where they first set out on their journey to the Titanic and where more help is now mustering to help find them. A Canadian Aurora patrol plane searching from above, dropping sonars to listen below after another Canadian aircraft detected underwater noises. With respect to the noises specifically, we don't know what they are. But searchers do think the sounds are man-made, providing some hope, though time is rapidly running out. The noises have been described as banging noises. The Canadian Coast Guard ship Terry Fox pulling out to join other Canadian vessels in the multinational effort to save the five people lost in the North Atlantic. They were onboard a submersible heading to the wreck of the Titanic. American aircraft have arrived carrying heavy equipment, including remotely operated vehicles used to search the depths. Then loaded onto the Horizon Arctic, considered one of the most powerful offshore support vessels in the world. Now on its way to the search site, 685 kilometers southeast of Newfoundland. I've been in the marine industry since a very young age and seen a lot of different situations and I've never seen equipment of that nature move that quickly. Horizon Maritime owns the Polar Prince, which launched the Titan around 8 o'clock Sunday morning, before losing contact an hour and 45 minutes later. The marine industry in this region is no stranger to responding to difficult incidents. As specialized equipment floods in from around the world, so too has the world's media, making the small, scenic city of St. John's the center of global attention. Oceangate, the company that owns the Titan, estimates air will run out Thursday morning. It's a terrible thought to know I have actual friends there, people I, I've met. New York writer Mike Reese made the trip himself. If they're stranded, if their air is running out, I know there's going to be calm there and, and resignation to it all and acceptance of it all. He says he would do it again if the five on board are rescued. Kayla, a bit of a tough question, but what are the realistic chances of a rescue at this point? Yeah, Adrian, there's no question this is a race against time. We keep hearing about those 96 hours, right? The company that owns the sub says it has four days worth of air on board for five people. But some who have made the trip have told us that's just a calculation. And because of that, others say there might actually be more time, that there are ways to prolong that air, resting, controlled breathing, not panicking. And they say if there is anyone who can do those things, they are the experienced people on that sub. All right, Kayla Hounsell in St. John's tonight. Thank you. Now, among those five people is OceanGate CEO and founder who piloted the Titan several times and hailed its design and safety innovations. But as Thomas Dagla shows us, there have been questions about its safety and whether the company took those concerns seriously. <laughs> Here's how the adventure was supposed to end. The crew opening the Titan's sealed dome, the way OceanGate showed in this video for would-be clients. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing? Hey. 
What the company didn't publicize were the concerns highlighted in a letter from an industry committee in 2018, warning the current experimental approach adopted by OceanGate could result in negative outcomes from minor to catastrophic. There's just no oversight, and then nobody really knows what's in the box. William Conan says OceanGate operated in international waters since neither the U.S. or Canadian Coast Guard would have allowed Titan to dive without formal classification. Sometimes that's an economic decision because classing is, um, it involves lots more money, lots more time. OceanGate, based in Washington State, never sought the external certification that would have required rigorous safety testing. CEO Stockton Rush, who's now among the missing, once told a crowd there was no need for third-party certification because Titan wasn't made of traditional material. These programs are uh, over the top in their rules and regulations, but they had nothing with carbon fiber. And while Rush boasted about the sub's novel controller... I can hand it to anybody. Some weren't sold on it. You can question a PlayStation remote as the main piloting tool, that and an iPad. Others wondered about a deep sea excursion this time of year. It's really early in the season, so I'm not sure, you know, why Ocean Gate went out this soon. Then there's that lawsuit settled out of court after a staff member warned of potential extreme danger to passengers. With so few answers about what happened, there's no telling whether past warnings predicted a disaster. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. The Department of National Defence now confirms two Canadian Air Force members were killed Tuesday when their Chinook helicopter crashed northwest of Osh, Ottawa. Right now we're gathering all the information, part of the uh, formal investigation, flight safety investigation. What I can uh, uh, confirm is just it was a normal, regular uh, night training event. Two other crew members survived with minor injuries. The Chinook fleet will take a pause from flying out of respect for those killed. There's been a big admission tonight from one of this country's biggest bread companies. Canada Bread admits to colluding with a competitor to raise prices, and it's agreed to pay a massive fine for doing it. Nisha Patel with why the investigation into price fixing is far from over. Canada Bread pleaded guilty in court and was fined after it admitted it worked with the rival to push up the cost of bread. The company, which makes brands like Dempster's, has been under investigation since 2016. Obviously, it's been some time coming, but this is a very, very large investigation. Matthew Boswell runs Canada's Competition Bureau. He says this is the largest price-fixing fine ever. $50 million is a significant amount of money for for you know most companies, um, and I think it, it should deter them. Grocery giants Loblaw and George Weston admitted to playing a part in the scheme in 2017 and got immunity from prosecution. Now Canada Bread says one of its bosses discussed prices with an executive at Weston Foods, which resulted in price hikes in 2007 and 2011. Back then, it was owned by Maple Leaf Foods. Mexico's Grupo Bimbo bought Canada Bread in 2014. It's really easy just to sort of blame it on the former regime and say, you know what, they were bad, we're not bad, we just want to get this behind us. Other major players like Metro, Sobeys, Walmart Canada, Giant Tiger and Maple Leaf Foods are still under investigation. They maintain they haven't done anything wrong, though this latest development could prompt others to come forward. This is a significant fine. This is a second player. And now you really do have a conspiracy. This case hits home for shoppers who buy bread weekly. It may be tough to regain their trust. They need to be held account for it, right? Did anybody go to jail? No. Horrible. We got to stop big business from trying to gouge every penny they can out of us. These revelations come with grocers already under huge scrutiny over soaring food prices. And while Canada Bread will pay the $50 million fine to the federal government, it and other major players are also named in two class action lawsuits. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. So you've likely been paying more for bread and other food for a bit of a different reason lately. Inflation and new numbers show despite that inflation and high interest rates, Canadian retail sales are still up in ways some did not expect. Philippe de Montigny explains why. 
this perhaps isn't what you would expect a mall to look like in a slowing economy. At this Toronto shopping centre, foot traffic and sales surpassed expectations so far this year. We're cautiously optimistic, but so far it's been going very, very well. I think the retailers are a bit surprised. The dwell time for our shoppers has increased. The average spend per shopper has increased. Retailers across the country raked in $65.9 billion in April. Their sales up almost 3% from last year. Canadians might be spending more, but they're not necessarily buying more stuff. I end up spending more because just overall prices have gone up. Only furniture, appliances and electronics sales are down. The overall boost nationwide is largely driven by general merchandise, food and beverage, and clothing. I think I spent more, way more in my, my outfits. We were kind of locked up in the house for quite a bit, and I mean, I definitely didn't go shopping that much at all then, so I just, you know, I've been kind of catching up. A sign of consumer resilience in the face of inflation, according to this retail consultant. With unemployment rates really low and mobility of labor and being able to leave your job and go get another one, um, you know, that just builds confidence in consumers. And that keeps the economy running hot, which experts expect will lead the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates again next month. They're going to want to see weaker spending. We have a 25 basis point uh, hike in July baked into our forecast. We're pretty sure that's a done deal. Now inflation numbers will be out next week, giving us a better snapshot of where prices are headed. A signal among many that will factor into the central bank's rate decision. Philippe de Monsigny, CBC News, Toronto. The premier of New Brunswick is facing a growing revolt from within his own party. His government has been in turmoil since changing a policy on LGBTQ students in schools. As Jacques Poitra explains, party members say they now have the numbers to push for a change at the top. All those opposed to the amendment, please rise. The rebellion against New Brunswick's premier is growing after six of Blaine Higgs's MLAs, including some top ministers, voted with the opposition last week. Mr. Holder, Ms. Shepard. Calling for more consultation on a controversial policy change that removes a teacher's obligation to respect a child's choice of pronouns in the classroom without parental consent if the child's younger than 16. The change was the last straw for one of his most senior cabinet ministers, who quit after the vote and after more than a year of frustration with Higgs's leadership. I resigned because there is no process. Cabinet and caucus are routinely dismissed. 65 to 70 people uh, that would be eligible uh, to vote. Now party members like this former minister say they have the numbers to push forward with an attempt to remove Higgs as leader and premier. It's coming from every part of the province. It's coming from the rural, urban area. Uh, it's coming from the north, from the south, uh, center. It's representative of the, uh, of the province. Party rules say letters from 50 members, including 20 riding association presidents, are enough to move forward. CBC News has seen 22 riding president letters, and members say they've also crossed the 50-letter threshold. Higgs has been toying with New Brunswickers for months about whether he'll retire before next year's election when he'll be 70. Today, he issued a statement calling the review push a strategically planned political drama and said he will stand his ground. There needs to be several more steps before the party would vote on his leadership, which wouldn't likely happen before early next year, with an election scheduled for October 2024. Jacques Poitras, CBC News, Fredericton. People gathered at events across the country today to mark National Indigenous Peoples Day. The Prime Minister and Governor General helped raise the survivor's flag on Parliament Hill in memory of the thousands of children who were sent to residential schools. Mary Simon said despite the sadness, it is a day for all Indigenous people to celebrate their culture and stories. And there's a new monument tonight in northern Ontario honoring missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Whitefish River First Nation unveiled the memorial at a special ceremony today. It is one of only a few monuments like it in Canada. 
CBC News was invited to spend time with the community. And as Olivia Stefanovich shows us, they are leaning on each other to reconnect with their culture. Rough, dear. Thread twice. Scattered threads now bound together. Oh, I love those. In memory of the missing and murdered. It just helps me relax and it helps me know that I'm not the only one in this world that's facing the loss, the grief, that there's other women besides me. Don't wipe your tears away. You need that healing. Jesse McDonald is among the dozens of family members who worked years helping with the design and waiting through pandemic delays, all for this moment. A monument dedicated to their loved ones. The first of its kind east of Winnipeg, shaped like a circle, representing the continuation of life, with a gap signifying the missing. That's my mom. Sandra McNeil hopes the monument will create a sacred place. Now I guess it's somewhere I can attend to and visit and honor my mom. Don Carice was last seen 22 years ago. I don't have a gravesite or anything I can actually go to, to, I guess, like visit or talk to her. Something about having a marker, something to pull the community together and understand that this is going on. Daniel Opacinas took a 12-hour bus ride to see the unveiling. His mom, Rachel Russell, was murdered when he was four. And like so many others, her case remains unresolved. Being around here, I like imagine her learning the same teachings that I learned and seeing the same things that I saw. Families healing through remembering on a day celebrating Indigenous resilience. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Whitefish River, First Nation. If you're affected by this crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, help is available. You can call the National Support Line at 1 844 413 6649 24 hours a day. Now, homicide investigators in British Columbia now say a prominent Sikh leader was killed by two men they describe as heavy set, seen running from the scene to a getaway car. Hardeep Singh Nijar was gunned down in his car on Sunday night near the temple he led in Surrey. He was a longtime pro Khalistan activist. Police had no update on any possible motive. One of the people injured in last week's horrific car crash near Carberry, Manitoba, has died. So that raises the number of people killed to 16. Nine people, five women, four men, remain in hospital. The RCMP says it will release names of victims on Thursday. That's also when a vigil is planned in Dauphin, which was home to most of the victims. Now, as the war in Ukraine rages on, plans to rebuild are ramping up. Russia must pay for what it has destroyed. How Ukraine's allies are trying to recoup that money from the Kremlin. Plus threats and fighting over flying the pride flag. We've had flags stolen and we had the house shot up. Katie Nicholson takes us inside a community divided. And the countdown to the FIFA Women's World Cup is on, but is Canada set up for success? I think overall, the Canadian uh, soccer has uh, let them down. We're back in two. So this is the chaotic scene just moments after a huge explosion in central Paris today. Two people are missing, at least 37 are injured, four of them seriously. Witnesses reported smelling gas before the blast, but authorities are not confirming the cause. The building houses a fashion school in an area popular with tourists. Ukraine's president says his country's long-awaited counteroffensive is going more slowly than he'd like, but his country's allies are already promising billions of dollars aimed at rebuilding Ukraine's war-ravaged economy. They got the ball rolling at a conference in London. Here's Chris Brown. In Ukraine's east, the battles are vicious and trench by trench. Ukrainian leaders say there's been progress in this long-awaited counteroffensive, 
but it's been tougher going than they hoped. Minefields are slowing Ukrainian advances, and these soldiers say the Russians have improved their tactics. The enemy is very active, he said. They're constantly trying to storm our positions. Even as Russian attacks continue to decimate Ukraine's cities, Russia must pay for what it has destroyed. Some of Ukraine's most important allies came to London to chart a course to recover and rebuild. The theme here is preparing for peace even during war. Ukraine's reconstruction bill is already enormous and the goal is to give business confidence that they can start making investments now. Britain announced it would set up a war risk insurance fund. This is a huge step forward towards helping insurers to underwrite investments into Ukraine. Russia's war knocked almost 30 percent off Ukraine's GDP last year. And while doing business near the fighting is still impossible, elsewhere the climate is slowly improving, an advisor to Ukraine's president told us. One of the key conclusions that you get from looking at how our private sector responds is that it's been incredibly resilient and people have adapted to a large extent to these circumstances. Corruption and bribery were endemic to Ukraine's economy before the war. Canadian Roman Waschuk, a former ambassador to Ukraine, has a new job as business ombudsman to help boost confidence. Two-thirds of the cases we take on, we resolve successfully. Uh, since the inception of our institution, we've managed to recover about $600 million U.S., uh, so about 800 million Canadian uh, for Ukrainian business. Using frozen Russian assets to help Ukraine's reconstruction is a popular idea here, but legally problematic. Canada is trying to do it with that Russian airplane stuck in Toronto, but whether to seize rather than just freeze Russian assets remains a big unresolved issue. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Two drivers are dead and a busy section of highway east of Toronto was closed all day after a shocking crash. So that huge explosion involved two transport trucks and a passenger vehicle. Police say one of the trucks was carrying highly flammable fuel when the driver lost control. Both truck drivers were killed. The driver and passenger in the third vehicle were able to get out and escape the fire uninjured. Authorities are waiting for engineers to determine if the crash compromised any of the highway's structural integrity. Now, neighbours are going head-to-head -head in a community that banned the pride flag. We have a flag, the Canadian flag, that's all we need. How we got here and why some are pushing back. We're not going to stop. We're not going to be afraid of you. Canadians in need of a surgery are being turned away despite their suffering. The pain is so bad. I just want to close my eyes and not wake up. Why a qualified surgeon is refusing to operate. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. This Pride Month, the Pride flag is being grabbed at both ends. For sure, flown across the country in solidarity, but in many places, pull down the target of opposition to what it represents from schools to school boards and beyond. Tonight, what happens when an entire town is a battleground and that flag is the prize? Katie Nicholson takes us to Norwich in southwestern Ontario. Marta McDonald bears her breasts and her anger toward a church she believes has too much influence. This is Norwich, a town divided over a rainbow flag. While churchgoers try their best to ignore Marta, a local PPC candidate confronts the protesters head on. In May, the Township of Norwich Council passed a motion to keep special interest flags, like the rainbow pride flags, off municipal property. Many here say it brings the town's values closer to churches like this one. On its website, the Netherlands Reformed Congregation clearly states it believes homosexuality, lesbianism and bisexuality are sinful 
and offensive to God. And it's not the only church in town that holds these beliefs. The churchgoers, quiet and respectful, but on Facebook, some people have been making threats. Might accidentally have a steering failure, wrote one person. She's going to be in for a wild ride. She won't last long if she ain't got security, wrote another. Vic Whitcroft knows firsthand how riled up people are. That's right. This truck drove by and fired pellets at Vic's house again and again, all after he put up a pride flag. Whitcroft has taken it upon himself to be a one-man pride parade. Proudly flying flags from his mobility scooter in the downtown, taking the fight to the street. Around the community, little signs of defiance, flags hanging from homes, chalk messages scrawled on the streets. These protests too much for some, like Peter Kivenhoven of the Dutch faith community. Chris and his husband, Scott Takis, moved to Norwich 10 years ago. Scott even grew up here. They always felt welcome until the last few years. Turns out, the mayor wasn't in. A few hours later, we caught up with him in town, and he declined to speak with us on camera. One person who was there when the bylaw was voted in is talking. Alicia Stubbs resigned from council that night. She also believes religious conservatives helped influence the bylaw. Some even submitted petitions in support of the bylaw to council. We asked the Netherlands Reformed Congregation for an interview, and whether it had any hand in this bylaw, they didn't want to talk. Whatever the driving factors, the groundswell of visible support for the queer community rising up against the bylaw 
especially poignant for Angel Butine, who grew up in the Dutch faith. Angel, who uses the pronouns they, them, ultimately moved away from Norwich. They say pride flags are important because they're a beacon of safety. that sentiment exactly why so many have turned out on this Sunday to a church with a very different set of beliefs. And to march through a downtown divided. A quiet pride parade led by an unlikely gay rights champion. A flag so many in this tiny town believe is worth fighting for, or against. Okay, you've, you've been back and forth to Norwich a few times over several weeks. When you talk about this polarization, what does that do to a small community? So this is really a small town of about 11,000 people. Everybody knows one another. Now neighbors aren't talking to one another. There's tension and paranoia. People don't know anymore who's friend or foe. So tension and paranoia, I, I, I get the principle of it, but, but when you look at the practicalities on a daily basis, what does that actually look like? So I'll give you an example. Just Sunday night, there was a guy, he's had about um, a dozen pride flags stolen from his property so far this month. He's taken a sitting in his driveway, keeping an eye on his house so nothing else gets stolen. He spots a car just down the road. Somebody appears to be watching him. He, he gets worried. He calls the police. Turns out this was another person, a friend, who was actually making sure nobody else stole his pride flags as well, sort of an unofficial neighborhood watch. But it really speaks to that sense of vigilance that everybody has, hypervigilance, but also that police now are on speed dial for so many people. All right, Katie Nicholson, thank you. You're welcome. An Ontario doctor is taking a stand by refusing to perform a particular surgery. How do I go from being on a wait list to being told no? How a dispute over pay is leaving patients in the crosshairs. For Canadians in need of surgery, this country's chronic health care challenges become acute, even more so when a rare condition requires a specialist, like scoliosis. In Ontario, this situation is becoming even more bleak. Lauren Pelly shows us patients caught in a fight between a surgeon and the government. Christine Kashuba tries to keep her body moving despite constant pain. She has been waiting years for a risky, hours-long surgery to correct her scoliosis. Every night I go to bed, the pain is so bad. I just want to close my eyes and not wake up. I don't want to do this again tomorrow. So that's so, her spine over it, here? Yes, and it's pushing my rib out. Okay. Spine. Kashuba's spine is curved 70 degrees in the shape of a C. But when she finally met her Toronto surgeon, he told her he wouldn't do the procedure. How do I go from being on a wait list for scoliosis correctional surgery, a spinal fusion, to being told no? Multiple other patients spoke to CBC News, saying they were also told no, all with the same surgeon. It's all because of a behind-the-scenes battle between their doctor and the province over health care priorities and how surgeons get paid. That physician, Dr. Stephen Lewis, sat down with us to explain why he felt he had to hit pause on his most complicated procedures. I feel terrible for the patients, first of all. 
Lewis says surgeries to correct scoliosis are complex, risky, and time-consuming, and there's no one-size-fits-all procedure. That means surgeons have to outline each segment of every operation before getting payments through the province. By early 2023, Lewis says he was still waiting to get paid for more than two dozen cases performed the year before. Tell me in advance whether you'll pay me or not. Don't, I'm not sure of any other public servant that waits over a year to get paid for his work. And, and most people would not, wouldn't tolerate that. In a statement, Ontario's Ministry of Health said some complex claims are subject to prepayment adjudication to ensure physicians don't get improper payments from the province's health care plan. Last year, Lewis fought a provincial decision to only pay a portion of his billings for one particular scoliosis case, but the appeal was denied. The surgeon told us that was the final straw. After that, he switched to offering just more routine surgeries. My staff need to get paid, my office rent needs to be paid, I have other expenses that have to be paid immediately. Lewis and other surgeons we spoke to say complicated cases are also competing for precious health care resources as provinces try to tackle other backlogs. Like many parts of the country, Ontario funds surgeries in a couple key ways. First, there's a bucket of general funding that hospitals can use for a variety of procedures, including complex cases like scoliosis surgeries. But there's also a bucket of streamlined priority funding from the province that's used for more common, standardized procedures, things like cataract surgeries and hip replacements. For priority spinal surgeries like disc replacements, the province wants to do 40% more, an additional 1,400 or so surgeries each year. There's no such push for non-priority procedures, like scoliosis cases. This is to the masses of degenerative conditions. Dr. Raj Rampersad helped develop the latest provincial guidebook for standardized spinal procedures. The goal, he says, is helping as many people as possible, but... It would be, um, you know, irresponsible to say that nobody gets them left behind. As for Lewis, he says the system itself has to change. No, I think that we have to sort out with the ministry how these cases fit in to their priorities. Meanwhile, several hundred patients like Kashuba remain on his wait list, with no word on when their surgeon will take on their cases. So Lauren, let's talk about Christine for a second. How is she? Well, she's still in limbo and in pain. She's still waiting for surgery. She's been calling Dr. Lewis's office, hoping to get in at some point. He did also send a request in for her to have the work done out of province, but that has been denied. And what about him? Do you have an update uh, on him or, or what about his other patients? Mm -hmm. I spoke to Dr. Lewis again this week, just trying to see if there's been any movement on any of these fronts. He said that he's still waiting for payments from the province. Uh, he's trying to get pre-approval now for the next 25 of these deformity surgeries. Uh, so far, no movement on that either. Uh, he's trying to squeeze in a few of these urgent cases this summer. And as I said, he's been recommending people for out-of-province care. But he said so far, all of those requests, not just Christine's, he couldn't comment on her situation, but all the requests have been denied. Wow. All right, Lauren Pelly, thank you. No problem. The FIFA Women's World Cup is one month away and Canada's got their eyes on the gold, how the team is shaping up. Plus... It was honestly like a surreal experience. It felt like a fever dream. This 14-year-old Canadian animator is making waves in Hollywood. We will tell you why in our moment. With just a month until the FIFA Women's World Cup, Canada's women want a new agreement on their compensation before heading to the tournament. And as Lindsay Duncombe tells us, that is just one of the challenges the team is facing as they prepare for the competition. Canada hopes these first drills could be building blocks to World Cup victory. I think just to make sure that, you know, we're, we're hitting the ground running, we have to make sure that we're practicing all these little nuances to make sure that we're the team that's hoisting that trophy at the end of the tournament. Julia Grosso from Vancouver. Canada is the seventh ranked team in the world and reigning Olympic champions. But players expect a long, tough fight. We've seen a lot of wins recently from Canadian players who play in Europe in particular. So they're coming in hot from those leagues. So it'll be really good to see. 
Canada has talent. Julia Grosso named the best midfielder in the Italian League. Kaylin Sheridan, the best goalkeeper in the American National Women's Soccer League, led, of course, by Christine Sinclair, who has scored more international goals than any other soccer player on earth. With goal number 185. But the team faces a formidable group stage, including a match against home team Australia and superstar striker Sam Kerr. Outside the group, the American squad is ranked number one and no doubt bent on revenge after Canada crushed USA's dreams of Olympic gold. There's fighting off the pitch, too. In an interview with the Canadian press, Captain Christine Sinclair said outstanding issues with Canada soccer need to be settled fast. We're not at a point where we're not getting on a plane, but time's coming where we want it done, she said. They're still waiting to hear about funding and equal pay, but they've also haven't been given a send-off game. So I think overall, the, the Canadian uh, soccer has uh, let them down. That criticism comes as a recent study reveals a lot of countries may be letting their women footballers down. It found just 40% of participants in the World Cup consider themselves professional, as in they get paid to play. And 66% say they had to take time off of another job to play in the World Cup. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Of course, not all soccer playing enthusiasts move like those women, but not to worry, the beautiful game is adaptable. What's known as walking soccer is gaining ground across the country. It is popular with seniors, and as Susanna De Silva shows us, they've got an international competition of their own. The rules here may be different, but the competitive spirit remains the same. A little worried about those 16 year, 60 year olds, I should say, who, who are going to be a lot faster than me because I'm almost 73. This is walking soccer. The rules, no running, ideally no contact, and no shots or passes above the knee. It's a trial program for seniors run by North Vancouver Soccer Club. This is an opportunity for them to meet people, to socialize, and also to play a game. And then the second aspect is really about conditioning and bone and uh, muscle strength. If this proves to be a non-contact hit, a full program will launch next season, adding to the more than a dozen across Canada. It was more of a sleeping giant and it's slowly starting to accelerate in its growth. And, and more recently, yeah, there's been uh, at least four or five inquiries uh, in, in maybe the last two or three weeks. The sport is hugely popular in other parts of the world with more than 1,000 clubs in the UK alone. The first ever World Cup is happening in August for different age groups. Canada is sending a team. We have high hopes that we're, we're going to be able to, to do the nation proud and, and really stamp a mark on, on the tournament. I think it's fantastic to see he's still got it, you know, still got the moves. Uh, yeah. Down more than up. <laughs> but just participating here is a big victory for James Stitchman and his son Brendan, used to having his dad cheer him on from the sidelines. About two years ago, my dad was in the hospital with, uh, with COVID and it was not looking good. He was hooked up on oxygen and so just to be here today watching him run around and be active and having fun and breaking a sweat, it's, it's really amazing. I'm the only player in the field today, I think, that ended up with about 11 yellow cards or warnings for running. Uh, the next one was going to be a red card, I believe, and I, luckily I ran out of time. A chance to be active and rekindle the love of sport. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Now this might look like a scene from the new Spider-Man movie, but it's actually a recreation of the trailer done in the style of the Lego movies. This is important because it was made entirely by 14-year-old Preston Mutanga from Milton, Ontario. And when the filmmakers saw what he did, they invited him to animate a scene in the actual movie. His talent is our moment. Your imagination is the limit, really. When I first came out, I, I just thought it was like amazing, like I was super hyped for this movie. Then I got the idea to like make it in Lego because like Lego's popular, Spider-Man's sure popular, and I love both of them, so like why not combine the two? After I was done with the trailer, I decided to like post it to YouTube and then Twitter, and then um, I checked back after like a couple of minutes and then that thing was like exploding. Like, Sony themselves was emailing me. Well, on the first Zoom call, they showed us some storyboards and I processed those storyboards and then kind of turned them into, into the Lego movie style. 
I built the set and everything by myself, and then um, got to work, essentially. It felt like a fever dream. Not bad, kid. Seeing my work on the like the big screen, that's what really like just lit me up, like made me super happy. Wherever you go from here, you have to promise to take care of that little boy for me. Getting to actually work on it, it was like just a dream come true, really. He's, he's 14. So uh, Preston says he wants to be a director and producer and that he's going to, uh, you know, practice writing because he wants to animate his own stories. You're already there, Preston. We've got our eyes on you. That is a national for June 21st. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.